Yeah, okay, right, I think that's probably about right. So, um, uh, work mainly by myself, but also credit to um, Sam's team in Manchester as well. So, presentation now outline. This is really about a process, methods. Uh, and we've gone yeah, again. Oh, well, get there sooner or later. It's about um, trying to design emotional laden a um, applications. And as you'll see, it has two sides to it. One is trying to understand emotions that the user might experience, um, and then correspondingly, what emotions you might want to have in system response to the user to try and make a profitable outcome. So when they sort out the technology, we shall see. Um, it's based in a medical application um, which is about dementia. So we're trying to actually track what happens from your keyboard and mouse use to detect early stages of dementia. So as you might imagine, this is a tad emotional because if we succeed and we find an emotionally um, laden outcome, in other words, this message is, please um, take some uh, follow-up tests, uh, you might have um, early signs of Alzheimer's disease. One, it's pretty damn bad news. So you know, affect, emotion writ large. Two, we're going to try and persuade you to take further follow-up tests and go and contact your doctor rather than burying your head in the sand and saying, oh, God, I'm going to... So it's emotion and persuasive technology, which I suppose is why it sort of ended up in this session. So there we are. Um, that's what we're going to do. Um, quick breeze through the method, uh, what we did, and then look at um, the actual application case study, and then we'll get on to a few research issues at the end. So these are the research questions. Um, one's just a methodological question, how do you do this? Um, considering there's very little guidance, almost no guidance out there in the literature. Um, then, <coughs> particularly, it's fake focusing on the analysis side as well as design side, there's whole reams of literature about how to design for emotions, particularly with um, characters, chatbots, etc. But trying to put the analysis with the design is something new. So there we are, the effect um, of the um, anticipated emotions and how that might be then responded by the system, hopefully for some um, profitable effect. And the third research question is what I always do, is applying cognitive psychology to design, which I think all HCI should be an automatic um, background and motivation. Here's just a little bit of research background. A lot of this area started out with Reason Nass, computer social actor, who demonstrated that a lot of media effects have emotional impact and are very persuasive. Um, there's then a whole bunch of literature by the Ica avatars, now chatbots people, all the MIT uh, uh, T crowd from Picard, Alan um, Pellishow, Catherine Pellishow, um, and before Tony Bickmore, etc. They've been designing emotion um, and emotional expression for their particular avatars. And they do it for a scenario, but they don't really take into any um, question of analysis. Their idea is sort of forward engineering. There's some guidelines about how to design for emotion, Peter Desmet, particularly for design, how to make your product feel happy, joyous, or occasionally maybe even rather sad and serious, etc. cetera. Um, and there's other ones, and particularly the games literature, of course, um, practice a lot of emotional type um, design even though a lot of it isn't actually um, articulated or written down. And then this is all fitting into the backdrop of user experience, um, where Mark Hasenthal, et cetera, has hedonics, which has notions really related to um, emotional um, satisfaction and reaction to products, et cetera. Noam Tretinsky as well, and there's quite a bit of literature on emotional um, uh, reaction and design to websites by Co et al. in Korea. So there's a bit of background for you. Um, plenty of um, agents out there, so I won't go um, into those. And of course, chatbots now, that's Alice, 
in an earlier in in incarnation, Jabberwocky, etc. Those are now widespread on the net. However, first of all, let's have a little bit of cognitive psychology. Emotion is your reaction. It's how you feel. It's usually something that is fairly transient, can last a reasonable time. The more longer it lasts, psychologists would call it about being in a mood, being in a good mood, bad mood, whereas reaction might be a classic thing of the Ekman five emotions, fear, anger, sadness, joy maybe, um, and disgust is the other one. But emotions are really um, embedded in the psychology of decision making. They influence decisions and reactions and responses in two ways. But also, they're related to beliefs and attitudes, our values about how we perceive the world. So we need to think in a wider sense than just emotions to actually think um, of our values and indeed motivations, what drives us as well. OK, if you're looking for series of emotions, um, Don Norman was mentioned by Herit in the plenary and has come up already. Um, I think Albrecht as well. Um, Don came up with a three-layered model of emotion. He said, well, first of all, there's visceral. That's gut feel. That's particularly your anger, your disgust type emotions. The very sort of primitive, animalistic um, emotion. Behavioral motivations are much more about how you're governing action. So that may well be one about anger or fear. And then the sort of reflective motivation, uh, emotions, which are much more about how you might then govern yourself in a longer time sp uh, span in terms of a situation. However, Don really never um, got beyond that. He never articulated how to use those except in very general terms. The one that everyone's used, all the Ica people, is the Ekman five categories. There they are, you can see. Um, and they tend to be visceral and behavioral. Um, and they don't really cover what I'm interested in, which is reactive social emotions. Because, of course, interaction, human-computer interaction, has two parties. It is a social process. So I use the Orkney Claw Collins taxonomy that Don actually does mention, and that gives me a nice, nice wider and more elaborate theory of emotion, and it has 22 categories, so it's about the Rolls-Royce, or the most comprehensive theory out there. Here's a look at it. Um, it's probably a bit um, too small to see, but the basic thing is what it does is it gives you quite a nice hierarchy going down, and what it's in response to starts out there, and then whether it's in response to your particular situation or others, and then it then breaks it down into subcategories. And emotion responses, of course, tend to be either positive, like joy, um, things like that, or they can be negative, fear, anxiety, distress, etc. The ones that I'm particularly interested in are at the top there, social emotions, because that's the area I'm working in, people responding to other agents, computer agents, or indeed to each other. OK, here's the method. Um, standard methodology. The main point to take home about it, which I've color-coded, is that it has two branches. It has the green branch, which is analytic. And that is focused on the user. What does the user actually feel or likely to feel in a situation? The other branch, which is sort of the purpley branch, is the design side. So what you're doing is you're asking questions about the user and you're asking questions about the system and they're going to converge in a sort of loop here, which is the classic sort of iteration um, and refinement prototyping in terms of design and the um, OCC taxonomy informs both sides of the game. Okay, the, the method, there's nothing magic about the method. It's scenario-based. It has a set of templates which structure the knowledge and give you advice about emotional responses, recording it, etc. It uses a prototype iterative UCD approach. Nothing new under the sun there, so I won't spend any time on it. It's in the paper anyway. So here we are. 
here's the, the SAMS project, which I was introducing while we were getting the, the setup um, uh, uh, feature and, got, and working. So health informatics, there we are. And here's the persuasive stuff. We want to try and persuade people, if we've detected a potential sign of um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, to take follow-up action and go and um, contact their GP. That's what we did in terms of co-design, um, standard workshop interviews, etc. That's what we investigated. Here's some just quickies about what we used as the cues for this. Um, the SAMS, that's just a very terse message about what you might want to have as a feedback. This is the avatar type version of it, and we used um, a standard avatar kit, it's Guile 3D Studio if you're interested, the Denise character. There's another one where the character is explaining more information. So the various permutations of how you can actually present feedback for persuasive effect. We did some um, initial testing and in a student project to try and figure out which is going to be the best expression to try and give a sympathetic feel. Now, that's really tough to do. These avatar uh, toolkits give you presets for the Ekmans, but they don't give you any presets for something like sympathy. What you can do is control the facial expression, the mouth, the eyebrows, gaze, um, and uh, general body muscles as well. I, the nearest we sort of got was those two there for sympathy. But you can see that even this one, which is sort of a bit sad, terribly good. And we'll see one of the lessons learned was really about the limitations of avatar toolkits. OK, so the results. What do we get out of all this? Well, surprise, surprise, fear, anxiety were the main um, uh, emotions. So those are the negatives that were expressed by users. No surprise there. But also the need for sympathy that um, was really empathy is just a technical term for sympathy. Um, and the fact that if you didn't have a problem, you'd get some sort of feeling of relief. Otherwise, you'd get more distress as well. When we tested a range of feedback presentations, we didn't really get any particular consensus in terms of the, the amount of information. Some people preferred the straight message. Just tell me, if it's bad news, I want to know. No frills, no embellishments, etc. Others liked some sort of sympathetic treatment, um, and then there was a split between the different media um, choices, but there was no consensus. So the persuasiveness um, showed great individual differences. Uh, the other things that came up, of course, these values. No surprise, privacy and security, you're monitoring people, your big brother there, those were an obvious concern which gave a lot of anxiety and fear about what might happen with my information. <coughs> and we had to do um, some further um, testing to try and assuage that. And those are some of the things we did to try and give you control over how the presentation, sorry, the recording could be actually um, turned off and on. So lessons learned here quickly. Persuasion, <clears throat> no one size fits all. So OK, this was fairly quick scenario-based testing, but there was no particular consensus on how I want the message. Do I want it with emotion or not? How much of a message do I want? Do I want a simple message, or do I want all the explanation with the graphics? And then. Also, whether I want it with media, do I want it with a video, or do I want it with an avatar? So we think there, you know, we've got some sort of configuration problem. Emotion. Emotion is actually very difficult to analyze, because especially when you're in quite deep emotion, people have difficulty in imagining what it's going to be like. However, role playing, which is what we did use, and scenarios can help. And then finally, the emotional expression, design side, of avatars is very limited. One, you get the uncanny valley um, a problem, but also you get the problem 
of emotional expression. And if you think about empathy, you saw the facial expression, not terribly natural, but to actually do empathy well, you have to actually use voice. You know, I'm feeling very sorry for overrunning. I won't go on much longer. And, you know, please don't worry, my dear chap. You know, it'll all be all right. No, there's a whole bunch of stuff I've just done there. You can't get an avatar, avatar toolkit to do. You know, with the best of the world, even if I could get the gesture, the tangibles would be out there. To say nothing of the whole culture problem of the fact that this was an artificial agent. So there are very good reasons why artificial agency doesn't work with complex emotions that I think has some very dangerous implications for the whole care industry that's now um, recruiting a lot of robots and a lot of chatbots to help empathize with seniors. Mm. Well, good luck, guys. I hope everyone's happy. And here we are. Here's a few conclusions. So the emotion is difficult to uh, unless it. People don't understand um, uh, you know, what it's about until they're in the experience, but you can approach it with various role play actor techniques. Now, Newell's done a lot of good work there. Personal, the persuasion needs to be personalized. We're going now towards the route of trying to have subgrouping and profiles match to the way you want the response. Another research project we've yet to do. So, individual responses there. And finally, there's a limited ability, even within OCC models, to connect the emotion to the design. I noticed what I had to do with empathy when I articulated it in gesture, voice prosody, as well as facial expression. And that knowledge just isn't out there, so plenty of research questions for you. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Plenty of questions to be had. The time, no. understand uh, one thing like when you were doing this research the entire idea was to get someone to go and take some tests right did you consider an alternative approach in which you recorded that person as somebody who has shown signs of dementia and probably the healthcare system contacts them back mm -hmm. yeah that, that's an interesting question so that goes into the larger socio-technical design of the project that <clears throat> we're now looking at at a follow-on project and the answer is, it depends. Right, this is classic socio-tech. One, remember the idea of this is that it's a web download. That's the rollout. So you will download it onto this. It'll be in your home. It'll be monitoring you. And if it finds an alert, and remember that's probabilistic, because this stuff is by no means certain. It's Bayesian at the base of it. Now, does it then send an alert to your doctor, who is a busy person? And the doctor then gets, you know, dozen, 100, 200 alerts. And the doctor goes, oh, God, I don't want this. So part of our analysis has been looking at the role partitioning between medical clinical experts and healthcare self-management. And interestingly, one of the um, emotional responses that we I didn't have a chance to go into was a notion of efficacy, empowerment. A lot of our users said, oh, great, I can use this as an auto checkup, and I can own it. So that's why we tended to go with the personal you know, approach rather than integrating it with the experts. However, of course, you know, we're going to have to address that sooner or later. And if you don't self-refer after three weeks, four weeks, and it keeps pinging an alert, in the end, we're going to say to the doctor, you know, please contact Mrs. So-and-so. Please, hi. Uh, just curious, have you heard uh, uh, an Android called Sophia? 
and she can like replicate so many social emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a whole load out there. And in t indeed, you know, there's lots of the robotics from Japan, you know, the Esmo, et cetera. Now, when you look at them, when they say social, what they can usually do is express some sort of joy or happiness. But I defy you to find anyone where they say they're actually doing sympathy. They might try to say they're doing it, but they're not. Because you, unless you do the voice, complex facial expression, and you do gesture, that's what normal human beings do. And of course, by the way, that's culturally sensitive as well. So there's plenty of examples out there where there are claims made by the HRA, HRI, human robot interaction community, and the avatar community. They're all right in terms of the, the five Ekmans. And what they do is they try and balance you know, joy and a little bit of sadness. And they usually swap between those two. And that's about where they're at. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? OK, then thanks again to the presenter. Thank you. Yeah, I'll leave that. Yeah.